Right, let's look through some of the headlines this morning, some of the papers and some of the big talking points. Connor Tomlinson is with us, Policy Director at the British Conservation Alliance, which operates at more than 30 universities and on its website says it focuses on market-based free enterprise solutions uh, on uh, conservation issues. He's also a Young Voices UK contributor. Connor, good morning. Morning, Callum. It's quite the introduction, I feel. <laughs> well, you know, we've got to give everybody their status, credit where it's due and all that. Um, Connor, shall we start with vaccines? Because uh, this is this is rumbling into yet another week of, um, well, so-called vaccine nationalism, uh, sort of back and forth between the UK and, and Brussels primarily over the supply of vaccines. Um, and a warning today, Ben Wallace, uh, telling EU leaders to grow up and work with the UK on uh, the COVID-19 vaccine supply. And I just wonder what we make first of all of the kind of the tone of this, the rhetoric around this and whether it's actually helpful and conducive to finding a solution. I think in terms of from the British side, I think it's probably as conciliatory as you're going to get from the EU. We're not exactly having our relations here based on good faith, especially when the initial delay of the blood clots was very unwarranted and there was a lot of scaremongering and quite ironic as well because there was some return fire quite a while ago from Pfizer's former head of respiratory disease putting out a letter saying there was some concerning stuff in the trials. Now, they didn't particularly feel it was necessary to address that. If that was totally fine, that's all fine. Um, ironically, I'm as a person with anaphylaxis, I can't even take the Pfizer vaccine, so I'm more likely to be killed by that than COVID. So I think the EU needs, if they're going to be concerned about a, a public health emergency related to a vaccine, uh, they don't need to be blocking our distribution they need a mirror yeah interesting and there's some suggestion around the kind of retaliation uh, potential i suppose from the uk so um so this one of the vital ingredients of the pfizer vaccine are made at a plant in south yorkshire and so there's been some suggestion from some commentators that if the eu were to block exports of pfizer to britain then britain could retaliate and, and ban the export of this lipids this vaccine ingredient to the eu which would prevent any manufacture at all and that's part of the war I think that you were kind of alluding to from Pfizer kind of early on in this whole process. But I wonder what you make of that, that as a strategy, uh, you know, retaliating over something as important as the COVID vaccine. It all seems a little bit, well, f- frankly, it seems childish were it not to be for the really serious consequences that this sort of, you know, confrontation could have on, on literally on people's lives. Exactly. I don't wish to revoke our bargain to power here, but at the same time, I don't want to operate from the same sort of utilitarian framework which the continental uh, despots over there are using. I don't think we should be revoking that because it, it revokes our own moral standpoint from which we're saying, hey, if this is truly as deadly as you guys say, and it's, it's what we think be. You know, it's appropriated our liberty school for over a year now. Um, perhaps don't play politics with people's lives and, and show a little bit of... Can, conciliatory action towards uh, our, our mutual play. So, so you, uh, your kind of suggestion there is the potential for the UK government to kind of be the bigger person in all of this, as it were, and sort of stand up and say, look, we're not, we're not going to do this. We actually want to work together on this one. Definitely. Uh, again, this, this is sort of endemic of the underlying philosophical contradictions which have caused the, the gradual ungluing of the European project. Uh, France and Germany were always going to take the most precedent voices in the union because they've each at different times especially throughout the sort of 19th century period espoused their own form of collective ideology where the the state takes precedent over the masses of the individuals where britain's always been rather liberal so we're always going to break away at some point either on an issue or through brexit um so we again have the opportunity to demonstrate why we're a bit more philosophical have a bit more philosophical integrity in this uh, particular schism um, I just want to move on to uh, Nicola Sturgeon just briefly because this is going to be a dominating story of the week as uh, well we're expecting the James Hamilton report potentially as early as today we're expecting the Holyrood Committee report conclusions tomorrow both of those considering whether she breached the ministerial code among other things uh, and then later in the week a vote of no confidence being brought by the Scottish Conservatives against the First Minister of Scotland of course and I just wonder you know the potential implications of this without pre-judging uh, and pre-concluding whatever these reports 
reports are going to say, although of course we got that leak from the committee last week, such as the uh, steadfast nature by which that committee inquiry has been conducted. Anyway, without sort of presupposing what James Hamilton's going to conclude, the implications of all of this are, are really quite fascinating, aren't they, in terms of whether Nicola Sturgeon broke the ministerial code and what the repercussions should be if indeed it's found that she did, that she did break the ministerial code, what should then happen? Um, and I, I read Alex Massey in the Times today, uh, the headline on his comment piece, a diminished Sturgeon is all Johnson needs. Rather than waving Union Jacks in a panic, the PM should focus on the SNP's troubled record. And I just wonder how the politics of this will play out, Connor, in terms of the future of the United Kingdom. Well, I'm waiting for the PM to start campaigning on rebuilding Hadrian's Wall, personally. But um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised. This is a, this is a, something for the Tories that will absolutely be an opportunity to make political capital on. I wouldn't be surprised as well if the SNP internally used Sturgeon as somewhat of a scapegoat. Um, there's been a lot of concern, I know Andrew Neil hit her on this in her interview quite a while ago, about their managing of the NHS even before mm. COVID. So something... something uh, uh, to pin on Sturgeon as, as the sort of fault for everything catastrophic and corrupt going on in the SNP would be an excellent opportunity for a Roman party to, to mutiny. And I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some dissenting votes uh, during the vote of no confidence mm. from their own MPs. Interesting to note as well what Alex says in his piece, Alex Massey writes, uh, as it is, in the coming days we may expect to hear a lot about Pretty Patel and other examples of Conservative ministers who have broken the ministerial code and yet remained in office, uh, which is an interesting thought. He, he starts his piece by saying if Boris Johnson were a better chess player he would have sacked Priti Patel. Home secretaries are easily found. A more cunning Prime Minister should have recognised that dismissing her for breaching the code might in turn one day heap additional pressure upon Nicola Sturgeon. What do you make of that? Well, yeah, I, I, I was chatting to the family members about this sort of story the other day actually and they immediately pointed out that Priti Patel's bullying scandal uh, which he had essentially admitted defeat on and had a payout mm. with wasn't with her money, it was with, with, with taxpayer money. Uh, so that's something that Boris is definitely going to be raked over the coals for because as much as we can all point and, uh, well, laugh with scorn at Sturgeon for uh, her incompetence, meaning Alex Salmon got a payout, well, so did Pretty Patel from the taxpayer's pocket. So the exact same hit can be placed uh, yeah. on their side. Yeah, interesting. Well, interesting to see what happens, what the conclusions of these reports and inquiries uh, will be in the next couple of days. Um, let's just return to another story on COVID and it's around regular testing for the public. So the public are going to be encouraged, uh, reports the Times, to test themselves for COVID-19 twice a week to try to help us ease uh, ourselves out of lockdown. Uh, the idea is to get everybody into the habit of regular swabs and it's viewed as a vital way to stop people breaking the rules um, and there's going to be an advertising campaign. It's all about us playing our part. I, I suppose as an initial reflection on this, Connor, it's worth it's worth considering that the lots of workplaces are already doing this sort of thing anyway. Do you like the idea of us testing ourselves, of kind of logging our own uh, COVID status, as it were, as we go through this unlocking process? I think it's a shift of the Overson window towards an incremental monitoring of ourselves role constantly. Again, Boris and, uh, and Dominic Rabb on several occasions have said they're not going to rule out things like a vaccine passport. I don't think that kind of intrusion into our private lives is uh, warranted. I don't think we should be ceding any sort of paranoid power over to private industry or the government to block us from retaining our liberties. And again, this is another kicking the can down the road measure of ransoming our, our personal rights back to us. And I, I don't think that's a standard we should accept. Do you really think that's what it is? Do you really think it's that intrusive? Is it not, is it not the, basically the equivalent of identifying in another, in another time, in another year, identifying that you've got the flu and so that you, you stay at home so you don't give anybody else at work the flu? Is it not basically the equivalent of that? It just requires us to, to swab ourselves, such as the nature of the virus we're dealing with what, what's so different about it because that would be contingent on, on voluntary action saying hey i'm ill i need to stay off this is the government saying hey you can't even go anywhere even if you were ill or aren't it i i don't i don't think that's a that's an equivalency i understand the government probably tries to make something like that but when when you're telling everyone that you can't do anything no matter your status i, I don't think that's fair at all but they, they've turned around and said hey we could have mass and social distancing with us forever mm. um the fauci has said the same thing in the united states but this is a, a very suspect suggestion um I, I wonder if it's some sort of germophobic pathology personally i think people should be able to, to 
take their own risk as much as possible. I don't think we should be having some kind of... Would you refuse, out of interest, would you refuse to, to take tests twice a week? Well, personally, I don't think I would, I would need to because I'm, I'm not quite going anywhere as much. And as well, my mum... My, my sure, but this, the, is, this the, is as the, part of kind of unlocking, though. Mm. This is the idea that as we're allowed to go places and as we're allowed out and about, that we, we, we should test ourselves twice a week so we know, uh, you know what our own status is and how dangerous or not we may or may not be to other people. Well, I, I personally wouldn't bother doing it. And again, it's contingent on the word loud. If they're going to tie this into the, into the reopening, I don't understand how that's acceptable. Mm-hmm. Interesting thoughts. Just another one as well. Another story this morning that we're waking up to, the, the protest in Bristol last night that we mentioned earlier on in the programme. Now, interesting to consider that, that what it was protesting was the, the bill. The It was it was um, called a kill the bill demonstration um, and it was uh, kind of aimed at the police and crime bill, which of course has been much talked about in the last few days uh, for indeed its strands that kind of uh, tackle protesting uh, and the right to protest. Uh, Priti Patel has described the event in Bristol as unacceptable thuggery and disorder by a minority will never be tolerated. Now clearly uh, there were fireworks thrown, there was uh, police vans were graffitied etc. But it's interesting the amount of um, concern that this police and crime bill has really stirred up. I think the concern is entirely warranted so from, from my sort of minicus perspective the fact that you can be policing any kind of process for being a serious distress serious annoyance or serious inconvenience is a, a nightmarish and nebulous standard for everything uh, it's also in the bill there was you can be prosecuted equivocated um property and personal damage to risk of causing disease and the non-specified nature of disease there is is pretty concerning because it means that the bill itself could be extended beyond covid and it sort of drums up the same thing as when prostitution was a uh, um, designated part of the public health crisis back in the 19th century. It's not the kind of thing that we should be doing. So, yes, there's, there's a possibility for principled opposition to this and a possibility for peaceful process to demonstrate. But then again, firing fireworks at police cars, smashing a skateboard rather weakly, I might say, into a, into a police window and flying the Soviet flag, as was uh, seen in BBC photos of reporting on the incident, isn't the best way to go about it. Connor, thank you very much. Thanks for your thoughts this morning. Uh, sounds like your jet's warming up in the background. <laughs> to go and uh, sort that out. But no, thank you very much. Really lovely to have you on. Connor Tomlinson, Policy Director at the British Conservation Alliance uh, and Young Voices UK contributor joining us this morning. Really interesting thoughts from Connor.